70 to 80 percent of the people you know and you've got a good relationship with whether being personal or business are willing to recommend or introduce you to people you'd like to do business with the people that you like to meet uh, meet 70 to 80 percent are willing to do that but only 15 percent of people ask people for an introduction so we wonder, you know, why we don't get the referrals or the quality of referrals, but why, I mean, why do we think that is? Why, why is it, in, how often are people asking in your week? Last week, week before, how many times are we literally asking for introductions? Do we do it? We don't know. Ollie's nodding, no, and no. he's nodding, and, and Andrew's nodding, and we don't. And, and I, I sometimes as guilty as that. In fact, I'm probably just as guilty as everybody else. So I thought it'd be a good subject to, to start out and think, you know, if we just asked a little bit more. And by the way, uh, welcome, Debbie. Debbie has got to leave at nine o'clock. I know that. And I've had a message from Rebecca. She's got to take a child to nursery, so she's not going to be on until about a quarter past. So, uh, um, Somebody just popped up there. So let, let's, can we, can we explore that a little bit? Why is it that we don't, if, and yet if, you, if, if I was to ask for a show of hand, who gets the most business from introductions or referrals? We tend to say, most of us, word of mouth. And yet it's only one part, as we know, it's only one part of the five steps in any marketing strategy, you know, uh, anybody going to BNI, it's all about referrals. Anybody going to a networking meeting, it's all about meeting people. But the expectation is we'll either sell to somebody in the room or somebody in the room is going to ask us for some business uh, to do some business with us or somebody maybe in the room is going to introduce us to somebody. So how can we shift that? God, if we ask for more people, if 80, 70 to 80 percent of people would be willing to recommend us, why don't we ask more people? Is it because we expect, because we get introductions from time to time and we expect that doing a good job or being a nice person or being polite or being responsive or being friendly is sufficient? Ollie. Um, yeah, I, I don't wonder whether it's just that we're all a bit too British and probably don't like to kind of ask other people for things in, in that respect to kind of there's maybe a pride thing with it um, and then I think there's also combined with that is maybe I particularly with myself I kind of maybe think that you know people are very happy to to say nice things and then there's also that kind of um, could worry that maybe they're not being 100% and so maybe they wouldn't want to refer you or something like that so maybe that you know the job didn't work out how they hoped but they're not willing to tell you that um, and so therefore they might not then refer or something like that. So I wonder whether there's, for me, there's a couple of things at play, but I think probably that it seems a bit, um, I don't know, just a bit sales, salesy or something to say, can you refer me to someone? And I think there's probably a nicer way for like to, to say that rather than going direct in hard and going, can you, do you mind referring me to anyone that you think I'd be of help to really? I think, I think it's a good point there, Ali. Knowing how to ask, of course, is part of it. You've got to find, you know, the way Marcus may ask for a referral or Andy might be different than the way Rod would or I would. So you've got to find, an, uh, and I think we ought to explore this, because if we can find an easy way to ask people, uh, then we'd probably do it a little bit more. Uh, and I think being British, is that being you? I.e. <laughs> Is it that we, we just feel a bit, uh, maybe not confident they will give us a referral, but this, but remember 70 to 80% who, who we've got a good, I'm talking about people we've got a good relationship with, we're more than willing to help with. Mm. Uh, Nick, uh, sorry, it was Andrew first, then Nick. Yeah, yeah I think Ollie's right, actually. I think sometimes you might think that you might be putting somebody on the spot. So you might feel that you, you may, and of course you're assuming as usual, but you're, you, you may be putting them into a, a bit of a corner potentially. But I also think that depends on your relationship with them. And if you if you keep in touch with your clients and you do get to know them more, I think you're going to feel more comfortable. I mean, I can reel off um, five to ten people that I work with. I know that if I phone them up, they, 
they would be very, very happy indeed. I never do, um, but I'm, I, get on, I keep quite close contact with those people. Other people that I've not, I've not kept quite as close contact, I don't know if I'd be quite as comfortable to ask them. So I think sometimes it's dependent on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you say you could ask them, you could rely on them, they would help you, but you don't choose not to. Is that because you're just busy and you don't need that? You're yeah, trying. it is at the moment, but it's in my but, back pocket. <laughs> That's the yeah, way I think about I mean, it. <laughs> that, that, that could be another reason. You know, we've got, we, we're comfortable with the amount of business we've got, so we've got sufficient business, so we don't feel the need. Um, but if there's anybody in the, on this call that have got any, uh, could use some extra business or extra quality business, it's still a good question to address. Nick? Yeah, I think, not dissimilar to what Andrew's just said, actually, I think if and when I do ask for introductions, I tend to ask them from people that I know better, or I think they know me, or they know the market that I'm in. And I've had enough time to build a relationship with them so I feel confident enough to ask for that introduction. I, I very rarely ask someone who I've only just met or only had one meeting with for introduction. I think it just feels too early for me to ask for that. So I want to build the relationship first, get them to know better, let them know me better. And then I feel it's probably the right time to ask for the introduction. And I do do it occasionally, but maybe it's about thinking a bit more strategically about it and um, being really considered about who, who you're asking for the introduction and what you're asking for. Um, I think you're right, Paul, if you do it strategically and really think about it, it could be very powerful. Well, um, I, I'm going to come back. I think that's a valid point that I think strategically is very key about who your referral partners are. And, and if you can gather those people around you and you've all got the agreement that you're going to try and help each other, open doors for each other, yeah. uh, and you've built the relationship, that's the most powerful. It's the most powerful in BNI. It's, even if you're not in BNI, that's the most powerful thing you can build in your own community. Uh, I don't think I'd need to go back to BNI as a member uh, because I know that if I could build five or six people around me, whereby there's a, you know a mutual respect, a similar market, then you can do that, and it's easy to ask people if we know what the game is. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, but I agree, timing is everything, and I'm going to come to Anne Marie in a second. Um, I I always find it. It's quite interesting when I watch are you, I watch a lot of YouTube and, of course, the number of people that, that begin the, the presentation, I might have seen them for the first time and they straight away ask me to notify the like button and the and the uh, the share button and what have you. And I'm thinking, hang on, I don't know whether there's any value here yet. And they should always ask it at the end, in my view. Andy's agreeing. It's ridiculous. But uh, uh, Anne-Marie. Um, can I flip it on its head slightly and say that if you were to ask me for a referral, and that's not an issue, obviously, sometimes I feel pressured because you've asked me for a referral and then I think, oh, my God, I don't actually know anyone that I can refer to you. So then I panic and start to kind of think I'm not giving enough or helping enough or supporting enough. So like for the person that you're asking for the referral, I guess I'm saying it's sort of it can be a different kind of pressure as well, which sometimes might make us less keen to ask. Did that make sense? It made sense in my head. <laughs> well, it, oh, it does. And, yes. and, I, I, and I think that can be the challenge at uh, BNI meetings. And I think that's why a lot of people get the wrong impression of BNI. And I'm only mentioning BNI because they're the only referral organisation that I know of. And... Uh, you know, people come away and think, oh, everybody's pressured to, to, to give referrals. You're not. Absolutely not. It's not your responsibility. It's the other person's responsibility to teach you who it is you want introductions to. That's it. Uh, and and if, anybody's got a pre is, if anybody's under a pressure to give a slip in my day, I used to give slips, um, it's ridiculous because the, the referrals are meaningless. They're an introduction. They're a lead. And whilst it might tick a box in the stats and get a, an applause or whatever, it doesn't impress the person that's just got this iffy lead at all. So I would definitely deter it. So nobody should be put under pressure. It should be a natural form when the timing's right, the relationship's right, and also the understanding of each other is right. I mean, 
I could say, right, could you give me an introduction, Anne-Marie, to uh, anybody that's overweight? Well, I mean, that's a, quite a broad one at the moment. But if I was to explain why that's important and how I can help them and what issues they're likely to be facing right now or concerns and how you might spot that, you would see, you, hopefully you'd see the sense if I'd educated you well enough. And if you believed in the service I can provide or the method, methodology, you'd probably be more than willing to introduce people, wouldn't you? It's not so much not being willing, it's not knowing people. That's what panics me. <laughs> that, because, well, cause I yeah, because I don't work, obviously, generally with businesses. I do, but my bulk of my customer base is consumers. So I panic because I think, oh, my God, I don't know any funeral directors or whatever it might be. Obviously, I do. But do you know what I mean? It's like that's where I feel the pressure. Yeah. If we think back to our modern, you know, life outside of these meetings, um, when anybody, uh, and you see it on Facebook, you know, does anybody know a good electrician in the area? Does any, can anybody recommend somewhere for lunch? Um, can any, rec any, you know, what, what do we think of this new film? Or, you know, people, people are quite, quite happy to ask for things. Then they get overwhelmed with about 28 electricians and uh, then they've got a challenge, you know? Um, uh, Marcus. <coughs> and by the way, Marcus, I just love it the way Ollie occasionally, you know, this tail wags off. <laughs> the first one is tail, though, as he got a cat. cat. I, don't know. I don't think there's a cat there. I think he's just it's not a real cat. cat. No, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a tail on a stick. <laughs> he was the he was the um he was the producer who used to walk across the bottom of the screen during his films. Um, Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Yes, it's a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, it's that like Hitchcock. Sorry, Marcus. Anyhow. What I was just saying, look, I'm, I'm not very good at asking people for referrals, but I've got my hand up there and I think it's for loads of reasons, but I need to get better at it. But I have got a story. Last week on a one-to-one, -one, uh, a pensions in my BNI group, a pensions advisor, I arranged a one-to-one -one with them. And I was saying to them, look, I'm finding it really hard to get referrals for you. Uh, could you just explain what you do a bit more? And he went off on this tangent about, and it was really, really, you know, uh, involved. And I said, look, I've got to stop you there. That is, means it's really boring. It means nothing to me. Look, I said, I know people who, people I know are freelancers who haven't got pensions or are not really interested in it. What can you do for them? And he goes, oh, yeah, well, we do a free pension. I said, you do a free pension with you. And it's like, why, why do you need to say that to me first of all? That's perfect. That's what I need to know. So what I'm getting at, Paul, it is, you're right, it is down to the people to tell you how to approach and what they do because yeah we don't know i don't know i'm not interested in pensions the bit the the big thing about as i say b and i is that itself the best part of it is an education program because people come to other if people don't have just come into networking because they think it's the thing to do it's not necessarily their remit to educate people there's no room to educate and unless people understand and are no more than they came in with then um, it becomes difficult. It's what we talked about last week. It's, you know, there's somehow uh, it's almost the blind leading the blind. It's not really his fault uh, until, you know, until it's pointed out, you know, till, till the right way of doing things is pointed out. Um, what I'd like to explore is this, uh, this uh, strategy that uh, Nick uh, talked about. Um, the reason why you as a creative, Marcus, find it very difficult to understand the words of a pension specialist is because they're diametrically opposed, anybody in the financial, legal, accountancy, to a creative is fairly staid and boring. And anybody that is uh, uh, to, a, to a lawyer, a solicitor, accountant, anybody that's creative, he's got their head in the clouds. <laughs> Sounds about right. So, so therefore, I think... It's far, and it's more, it is more difficult. It's far more difficult. It's easier, believe it or not, if somebody's got an obscure business. I was on a call last week um, 
and uh, with this sort of uh, a, a new sort of Zoom type technology. And I ended up in, a, I missed the start of it, but I, I was ended up in a, in a room, you know, an offshoot room, a, a breakout room. And we were asking people what they did. And this particular person, and I say person, uh, was about to launch a, uh, a course and she specialized in voice uh, voice training for, for people that were, um, uh, I nearly said transgressing. What's the word? Um, a moving from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. And she specialized and she was overwhelmed with a number of people that were doing one-to-ones with to train their new voice. Um, and she, she was launching this, uh, uh, th- this particular course. She would be a lot, I think it was a she, almost certain, would be a lot easier to refer than an accountant because there's not many people like that, you know. It stands out. So I suppose it's about standing out uh, in some way. So I'm going to come back to the strategic call. Um, and Nick has said that he he does ask for referrals. Do you do ask for that in a particular way? Do you find it easier to ask for people that are in your... I mean, who do you tend to ask? Is it clients or is it referral partners or people that you know well or people you get on with? It doesn't tend to be clients, and it probably should be. I should probably go back and look at how I how I could talk to previous clients. I know and Andrew said he's got lots of clients that he could talk to if he want, you know, if he set his mind to it, you know, when he had the time. I think for me, it's look, it's more about looking at um, complementary partners, so other businesses that have got the same clients as me. So we've got something in common, and therefore they would become good referral partners. And, and, and already the conversation is going to be at a different level because we, we either work in the same industry or we, we have something in common that we can talk about. But it's, generally, it's, it's both people that I know fairly well as well. So it's not just, for example, it wouldn't just be a web designer. It would be, it would be somebody that I've met and we've built a relationship with first. I think, as it, I said before, I'd, probably, I'd wait until I got to that point before I had that conversation. Yeah, it's easier with with those people. But I'm going to come back to you. Welcome, Rebecca. Uh, Basically, we're talking about referrals and for the last four months of the year. And I think the stat I brought up to begin with is that 70 to 80 percent of people that you know well are willing to introduce you to people you'd like to be introduced to, i.e. a referral. Or let's call it an introduction. I think it's an easier way but only 50, they'd be willing, but only 15% of people ever ask. And we just basically agree, we just don't ask enough. Um, And I'm going to call it introductions. Instead of referrals, let's just start switching it to introductions. A referral is somehow, it's a bit obscure for many people. It's a, it's a in word, far better, you know, I'm looking for introductions. Um, you know, so uh, Nick has just said that he does, he wouldn't ask clients. Now, can I ask you, are those clients B2B clients? Do they have businesses or they uh, they don't have a business? So, you know. It's not that I wouldn't ask them, Paul. It's that I haven't asked them. And I oh, probably right. should be. Right. Um, but you've I, also... I think, as Andrew said, it's, <laughs> I, just, I just haven't really considered being how I approach asking my previous clients for referrals um, right. or introductions. But you've said that the easiest way is either with with, uh, people that share the same clients or people that you know well. All right, so how do you know them well? How do you get to know them well? I'm I'm going to tease an answer out here. How do we get to know people well? It's uh, For me, it's multiple contact points. Hang on, sorry. Uh, sorry. Nick Nick and then Rod. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry, I think for me personally, it's about multiple contact points. Take a somebody. So it's because you've contacted them on a number of times and you've slowly got to know them. Yeah, and we've got to know each other. Yeah. All right, Rod. Yeah, I think the way I <clears throat> the way I get um, uh, if you like my referral partner in is that uh, I'll ask the um, the client if they've got someone they want to run the service. So we're now talking about a funeral service, and if they haven't, and nine out of ten of them haven't. Uh, then I naturally will introduce my celebrant and my celebrant works with me almost every time. And so I built a a massive relationship with her. She's also a will writer. 
So it allows me to bring her into several conversations in relation to funerals. Now, <laughs> I've just sat here and realised that, of course, I've got a very useful way of completing the circle on a funeral when I de deliver especially ashes to get the testimonial, which is almost like a referral, but it's someone else saying something about you. But when I do funeral plans, I'm extremely lacking. And, um, uh, and I realised just listening to the conversation that I need to view a funeral plan as a funeral and make sure that when I complete the funeral plan, that um, I deliver it in such a way, like I would deliver the ashes at the end of a funeral, where I can take the opportunity to A, ask for a testimonial, but B, more importantly, because they're alive, do you know anybody else that could be could benefit from what we've done together? Well, <laughs> you know anybody is something I would want to. Anybody, I'd never use anybody and everyone, but I know you've said that off the cuff, but you're right. Yeah. You, you could do it. You're actually getting a chance funeral if you're thinking about it like that. And if you were to say to people, do you know... Half of the people that in this country, half of the friends that you know, probably have not thought about having a funeral plan. But this is the issue that they're going to face. Bum, 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 whatever that is. Mm. Um, and it gets them thinking outside of the pair of you about their friends that may be missing out. And then you say, they're the sort of people I'd love to be able to talk to. So if you found some benefit from that, Imagine that you, you, you know, your friends and the more you, you impress upon people and especially if you're writing a funeral plan and you're almost hinting on how you would like that to be, you know, the fact that, you know, the process you go through, that's the difference you make. It could be a lot easier if you find that way. Mel. Yeah, it used to be called recommend a friend because it was so obvious that's, that's what they were doing. And it always used to come with an incentive. Now, depending on what the product is, maybe funeral plans are not the right kind of product to, to have an incentive, but it was always recommended a friend. It, it always either appeared as a, as a, a piece in a mailing pack and it always came with, a, with an incentive that both parties got. So you were getting something, the person you were recommending was getting something as well. I, I think people find it easier to recommend a friend, first of all, if they trust you, the person mm. that's doing the recommend the friend and and they feel that they get the their friends are going to get the value they believe they've got or they believe that you offer so it's two things they trust you and the value and when you ask for if you ask at the wrong time a do they have you got to a stage where they trust you and secondly as you're asking are you giving that value are you showing people and demonstrating why they would want why they would want to be yeah. introduced, and it's not, and it's also not a hard sell. It's a conversation that they have over a coffee or a beer or something like that, and and it's, the conversation goes something like, "This is what I've just done, and it really looks like it's a it's good value. You know, why don't you um, look into it?" Yeah, um, I'm going to come back to what Nick was saying and the question I was asking of Nick: Why, you know. What, at what stage is it that you, that you feel you've got a good relationship and that you know them? And the, what I was trying to look into tease out is that you can only do that if you've, sufficient in, you've had sufficient interest and questions about their circumstances beyond your relationship. You know, the more you ask the questions and delve into, uh, in a nice way, into their circumstances, the more you're going to be able to help them. Sometimes you can help them more, uh, but very often it's a case of who you know that could help them that does, does, doesn't quite do what you do. That's why it's easier with these strategic groups, a lot easier. I think, um, I mean, Marcus is nodding to that. Do you agree? It, well, I think it, I was nodding to what you're saying with these strategic groups and looking at the people in front of me. I think, yeah, I think because we all get, we all know each other really well, I think we'd all probably find it quite easy to refer any of us. Right. Well, that's what I wanted to do next. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the one, of, I mean, there's there's many many openings you can use um, the. An easy one to uh, 
to at least get them thinking about introducing you is to actually lead with, is there any, but, you know, if, if let's say I'm looking to uh, Martin and uh, Martin and I have, have met at a, at a networking event or we've done a one-to-one and we've said, let's explore. Uh, I always use, I always lead with, let's see if we can get to get, get together for a one-to-one and see how we can help each other get more business. I think it's the easiest phrase that you can use. And if you've got that as a genuine mindset, now in fairness, like Marcus, sometimes I let them lead and it never gets around to me, but that's the way it is. And that just gives you the measure of the other person. But maybe it's their lack of education. Um, or at the end of it, you could say, well, uh, just let me tell you, can, have you got some time for me to explain some of the uh, some of the people I'd like to be introduced to? It can also be a lot easier on things like LinkedIn if you do a bit of research and see who amongst their contacts, especially their number two contacts, call up number twos and see who there you'd like an introduction to, find out whether they know them well and why you'd like an introduction. That could be a very rich source of business, especially when you go to that other person and say, look, we both know Martin um, and uh, Martin recommends you very highly. And I just wonder whether we could get together for a one-to-one because he thinks there could be ways in which we could help each other. Now, again, words like that and and an attitude like that, you've got to have a genuine attitude that you want to help somebody get more business. And you may need to, the more experience you get, you may need to do the lead. You may need to do all the teasing out of it. Um, So who's in need of some more introductions and referrals right now? Just a show of hands. It's a bit slow there. It was Anne-Marie, Rebecca, nearly everybody. So Anne-Marie, right. Um, let, let's let's go with yourself. At the moment, who are the who are the people you're having the most success with in terms of relationships or in terms of clients? Let's say clients. Let's go for the business, shall we? Who in the last few months have you had the most success with? individuals that's really hard because it's so it's so varied well let's give us a variety then um okay so um i've got two two clients coming on board in september one is um does health and wellness and fitness for men so we're doing his book and the other one is a lady who wants to write a fiction novel while she's on holiday in greece right so (laughs) The health and wellness fitness person, why, yeah. why do they want to work with you? What, what, what don't they have that they could, uh, that, that you help them get? Um, well, he's an interesting one because I spoke to him in January, followed him up and he didn't get back to me. So I, I just figured he was one of those that had, you know, um, and then he came back to me about three weeks ago and said, are you still there? Can we go ahead? Which was like eight months down the line. So it was really bizarre. Um, so it was good because obviously he'd remembered me, which was obviously a good thing. But I, I suppose with everybody that what they all want is, is nobody knows where to start. I think that's the key. People no, come I, to me because they, they want to produce this thing, but they don't know how to do it. That, that, that's fine. But I want to go back further than that. Why does he want to write, have a book written? Why does he want to write a book? What's his motivation? Um, because he wants to help support his clients with something written um, that they can go away with. And it's just another stream to his business as well. So that sounds like a brochure. I'm being provocative here. Is it, Could it be that he just wants a... I mean, the book, if he's doing it for that person, it's a brochure. But more, is it more about what he does or is it more about the story, his story or the client? Or, or, or his clients? Um, I'm not 100% sure because we, we're not, we're having the second meeting at the end of the week. So we haven't really dug too deeply into it. I'm only going on what I remember from our conversation in January. But my understanding was that he has got a bit like you talk about your pillars of marketing. He's got five pillars of wellness, um, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah. And he uses these with all of his clients 
and now he's developing that and he wants to make that into a into a reference book so that a his clients can take it away to remind themselves of these five pillars and how they use them but b it's another revenue stream and he can it can sit there on amazon or wherever and so he wants he wants to put it on amazon yeah i no. i everybody that i work with with very very few exceptions wants to put their book somewhere ah and where is somewhere amazon? Uh, generally amazon um and i get the very odd person that wants to traditionally publish but that's very few most people want to get it on amazon and in a bookshop right not just kindle paper form as well yes all right how did you get this client um god I can't remember what I did yesterday, Paul. I can't remember how on earth I got him. <laughs> um, how did I get him? LinkedIn, I think. I think, right. I, I think he came to me. For, he wasn't networking or any, anything. He was a... He came a, to you? Yeah, he came to me. Yeah, he was a sort of a cold... I think, yeah, I think it must have been LinkedIn. All right. And by the way, if anybody wants to dive in and ask Anne-Marie any more questions, please do so. I'm, I'm going to explore these in a minute. But Andrew? Yeah, very quickly, Anne-Marie. Um, something that I do... Um, which I find really beneficial, actually. I keep a spreadsheet on where people come from. So I always know um, that connection, and it's amazing. Like some of the sort of tenuous, you know, somebody I met years ago that I did a bit of work with, referred somebody approached them, they referred me, and then a friend of theirs then contacted me. And it is, honestly, it's crazy, but it's really interesting, and it really allows you to keep track of where that stuff, where these people actually come from. So I would really highly recommend that. Really easy thing to do. Yeah, that's a really good shout, actually. It's something that I I try to do, but don't do very well in my CRM. Um, and I find myself turning up to a one-to-one -one thinking, sorry, how did I meet them again? And having to frantically try and backpedal so that when I meet them, it's it doesn't look like I've completely forgotten who they are, which I most probably have. Fred, so that's, Fred, really, that's, that's a really good simple. shout. The easiest simple. way for that is to have a have a list of tags that tell you where so you just do a pull down menu tag and that's it that's the because you can only ever have one i met that person at and then i just add a little bit of a note nick you had a point yeah just that habit i think whenever you have a contact with someone to say out of interest how did you hear about me just dropping that into the conversation in a, in a very conversational way it's amazing what you can find out just by asking that simple question Re the reason i'm asking that question is to find out where you know whether there could be a, a common thread or there's this something that could lead me into other people that could come in that way but i've picked up enough anyway first of all the first thing i picked up there was that you took the time out after about four or five months of hearing nothing to say you're still there are you still interested that is first class very few people will do that so you know and it and she's seen the reward for that and sometimes because we've left it so long uh, either we're aware we've left it long so long or we've just forgotten about it. We just don't follow up. The fact that you've followed up uh, and reached out again has resulted in, a, in the fact that, yes, he is interested. And it's probably, if you had not contacted him, he still would be not you know, wondering how to solve his problem. What I'm thinking about here is it's, it's, this is more than a brochure. It's, and, and I would imagine when you've put your touches to it, it won't just be a load of facts. Uh, or tuition it might be a story uh and people a bit like the the richest man in babylon and some of these other books some of these best-selling books have been uh points they want to get across fabled in in fable fashion etc but i'm just picking up on this amazon and nowhere in the conversation before in any of our conversations i've, I've even thought about anybody that wants to have their thoughts and their their process put onto Amazon. They want a book on Amazon. Uh, I mean, that, that's a new one to me. And then that could be really massive. And I, and do you know, I was thinking about, I was actually thinking about Marcus at that time, uh, only because we've had this conversation recently uh, about a typical client for Marcus and um, a typical client for Marcus, I would think, uh, is somebody that's larger than life, is a bigger personality, uh, has got that ego. And that's mainly not, not nothing uh, as opposed to Nick. It's because Marcus wants to deal, deal mainly with men. 
and most men, if, if you've got a man that has got a large personality and will walk into a room and say, dominate a room, and we keep going back to Brad Burton, people like that have got a sufficient ego to want to have their photograph all over the place and are willing to pay for that, you know? People that are very individualistic in the way that they dress. Uh, and again, uh, Rod would come to mind. So all of a sudden, they're a lot easier to spot for somebody like Marcus. Now, I'm thinking that Marcus and Anne-Marie would be great referral partners for the simple reason that if, in that instance, because there'd be some people that, that, that want to express their individuality or their, their approach to their business, their difference with a book on Amazon, most likely could be a good cl uh, uh, client for Marcus. And also, Marcus has got clients. He's got a stylist, for instance, that is larger than life. He's got a really nice personality, et cetera. And he's got a special skill. Maybe he would want to put that rather than just in a brochure, but on a book. Again, it could, and it, it wouldn't necessarily be trying to plant that, but it'd be basically that introduction. You know, I've got somebody really interested, you know, really interesting, and I'm sure you could help each other from a business point of view. I'll bet he has got clients that could be potential clients for Anne Marie. I bet that client that you dealt with the other week, the MBE or whatever, would she be a good introduction for Anne Marie? Yeah. I've already, I've already met, <laughs> I've already met her. There you so, go. So she's she's already doing a she's doing one of the COVID stories. Actually, I'm talking to her this right. afternoon, and she's she's already published two books. So we've kind of missed the boat with her. But <laughs> well, if she's published two books, she could have another two in the in the waiting. I think she's got a team of people that do those things. <laughs> okay, so you're not going to win everyone. You're not going to no. win everyone. But but nevertheless, can you see how that would follow normally yeah. from a timing point of view? Um, I hope that. That's been a little bit helpful. Anybody else that's, that could be could do with a few more either high quality, higher quality referrals or or whatever. Who? First with a hand. Hand up. Martin. Yes, Martin. So, what sort of um, what sort of client do you resonate with more easily? Uh, we've talked about Marcus and uh, funeral uh, uh, and financial advisors. There's not a big match there. Uh, and I might assume I know the answer to that from knowing a little bit. But what sort of clients do you feel more comfortable relating to and having conversations with, Martin? Um, I know it's, it's general, but uh, I'd say somebody who is keen to have design at the front of um who they are or appreciate what design is, what branding is, what All right. good design is. So somebody that has a love of good design and, and, and that obviously uh, that's a very brave statement. And that says a lot about you because there's lots of designers about, but you said something there that really appreciates really good design. That's what I picked up from that. So who, what sort of people could, what sort of business categories or what sort of people would that be? And think back to some of your past clients. Um, okay, so uh, so recently um, I'm doing a website for a bakery. So I wouldn't say they're the people who run the bakery aren't, you wouldn't say they're like creative people, but they're, open and they don't mind spending some money um they didn't mind spending some money on nick doing photography so but and that was again that was somebody i approached i just phoned them up and then a year later i emailed them and then they said they were oh yeah actually we do want to go ahead um i i've enjoyed i've done a brochure for a school recently um that was very enjoyable and um social media for uh charities all right um, yeah and also a full brand exercise with uh an individual uh, he's a broadcaster pyrotechnician expert so he's wanted a full so i went through the full process and produced 
a brand and now I'm in the middle of doing his website. He's, you know, someone like that I, I really enjoyed working with. Why? Because he, because he wanted to, he wanted to start at the beginning. He, he, want, he didn't mind paying for me to sit down and listen to him and write down all his brand, you know, uh, position his brand, work out exactly who he was. And then I went away and did mood boards and a whole set of designs for his brand. And, and so something good came out of that process or I feel it did. He was happy with it. So in a similar way that uh, Ewan did the presentation you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, that, that sort of process of, yeah. um, is, you know, has a good end result and it's really enjoyable. It's probably right. Is it really enjoyable because you've got control of the whole thing? You can rather than just be being given a little bit of something. Yeah, and also they're engaged in wanting a good result at the end. I think that's. Um, well, was he new to business? Who the um, no? He he'd been in business for a long time, so he had a sort of a, a, a website that didn't really reflect who he was. And he's, I mean, it wasn't really a logo. So he'd spotted me. I had my details up on Bristol, uh, Bristol creative industries. Yeah. But he just saw, you know, which was really nice to, for somebody to pick you out of all those kind of, those loads of design companies. So he kind of said, oh, I really like your work. I want to work with you. So, you know, I suppose I'd put him kind of up there as a, as a kind of enjoyable project and, and can and and can you remember the reason why I asked whether he was new to business? I can understand somebody new to business appreciating they need the whole much more than just a logo or just a website. Yeah. And I only I say that respectfully. They want they want it to yeah. encapsulate who they are. Uh, is I can understand that from somebody that is already in business. What about but if they sorry that's new to business? But if they were already in business. Can you recall why they were dissatisfied? What, what, how did um, that get into the conversation? <clears throat> I guess he was, he was successful, but he also realized that he had many different parts to what he did. So he wanted to try and create a more coherent look and brand around the many factors. So I think he'd worked for many years and then just kind of put together, cobbled together a website and some kind of logo. And, but he was all, you know, he was already busy, but he, there was, a, I guess there was a point where he thought, oh yeah, actually this doesn't make any sense that some, like one customer doesn't really know that I also do this, you know, so he wanted, you know, that a customer that came for one service, he wanted them to be aware that, oh, actually, I can also do this for you. So it was, I think it was just a, I don't know, a slow realisation. I think there are, I think, uh, there are many people, and this is where you can, uh, you can be asking for a referral. Um, by using the, be using the phrase, do you know when? And then you describe a situation. So you, we might describe and we might see people and say, do you know when somebody starts in business and then the business, they get carried away with the business and then they add on this and they add on that and they take on this and eventually they lose sight of who they really are. And yeah. they've got this, they themselves have got this confusion and realize that perhaps missing business on higher quality clients because they don't who they are. Well, Martin's a really, so that's the sort of client would be really good for Martin because he, he cuts out the confusion, makes it really simple. And instead of all little bits of disparate parts of his business, he brings it into one much bigger business, much bigger sum of the parts. They're the sort of people that Martin would be really good for being introduced to. Can you see how in that short question, when, you, when you're with a potential, you know, maybe a one-to-one, -one, and you're really trying to help them and trying to understand. You, I mean, would that? I'd go back to Martin. So, would that be a good summarization? Yeah, oh, that's so, an excellent. So, if that was a really satisfying client, that is what you should be asking for. And you don't have to ask them for the business, and you don't have to expect them to be able to think of it straight away. 
But if you were to get that, plant that message to somebody on your one-to-ones and say, look, there's lots of people I can really help. I've helped schools, I've helped charities, et cetera. But some of the best business I've done and the most satisfying is where I've got in front of somebody that has got a business that's reasonably successful, but they've added bits and pieces as they've developed. And now they no longer know who they are. In fact, they confuse themselves. The so Lord only knows what their clients are. And they realize they need to stand out for to be something much bigger than the bits. Can anybody, yeah. can anybody right now think of anybody like that? Because if you can, talk to Martin. Andrew, you had a point. Yeah. Um, it's gone. That's, like, that's old age, isn't it? So um, if I do remember it, then I'll pop I'll still my hand up. Just grab it, you know, <laughs> grab it. Could have been a portable. Ball. <clears throat> I mean, one of, the, one of the questions I might have asked is the work on the school that you did. Uh, and how you got that, and and why why has the school got a budget to be employing somebody like yourself? Um, how I got it? Well, I just heard it was um, basically um, my daughter's school, so yeah. they wanted they yeah the new there was a new headmaster. He saw it as important to have um, visual communications that reflected the school. So I had to go through a sort of competitive tender with the school governor and, and a panel of people. So I won, I won the project. And so I've done, uh, now that's rolled into a couple of projects and there's one more to do in the new term. So, but they seemed, they didn't seem, yeah, they didn't seem frightened. You know, it wasn't a fortune, shall we say. Um, yeah. But, you know, I didn't sort of charge kind of, absolute top rates but it was an interesting project yeah 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 so i think if you got well there's t- potentially two there but i mean you, you if i was to spend more time we can unearth others but i think you've then got to choose what's the more rewarding in terms of your own satisfaction and financially um because let's face it schools are a subject in themselves if somebody wants to go after schools you only mm-hmm. need to put one or two and then you've got those as some credibility and schools, especially private schools, are very competitive nowadays to get those foreign students. And, the, you know, it's big money. Um, yeah. And um, anybody else, anybody else we can not pick on and try and develop? Who else would like some more referrals? Nobody else, you've got enough, you've got enough business. Anybody else? Well, let's pick on Rod for a minute. All right, Ollie, Ollie. Then we'll maybe pick on Rod if we've got time. Um, Ollie, right, you're you're fairly new to business on your own. You've been got a whole load of uh, clients. I don't, have you got a, a restriction on recontacting those clients now that, or has somebody bought Mike's business? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've got uh, nine months until I can contact them. So until December, until I can get in touch with kind of um, clients I've worked with before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, what sort of what sort of clients can we help you with? What sort of business what introductions, be as specific um, as you can? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it is hard for particular. I think, like we sort of Martin was saying as well, we work with a varied people. Um, you know, a lot of everyone kind of needs a website generally. But I would say it does tend to be for me. It's either the the very startups that kind of they've got a business they've got a, an email address you know a gmail address or something like that and they've got that on their van and then they just don't know where to start next they're kind of they know they need to you know take it to the next level but they're not sure where to kind of go with that or it's the people that have done something themselves you know using kind of wicks or something like that and it's just not kind of as good as they want and they need that kind of professional um advice and input to kind of help kind of just take it to the next level and it's maybe not working for them i think it's probably the biggest thing is that they've got this website and you know it's not bringing them in work and they're kind of wondering why why isn't it doing that is it the design is it getting the traffic that kind of thing it'd be usually traffic i would think Mm. um You've mentioned straightaway startups. You've mentioned people with vans. 
you know, that's self-employed generally, I would think. I, don't, mm. I can't assume that. Um, have you found that sort of profitable business, you know, um, in, in for your, your skill set? Because in my experience, most people that start up a business don't have much money to start up a business or if they've if they've if they've been employed they don't know the value it's a big jump from getting a wage every month and then suddenly having to put your money in your pocket and paying for things and then wait for business to come is that is that is that a low-hanging fruit or um it does tend to be quite profitable it tends to be people who have um a bit like you're simple with people that then start adding bits to their business so they for example i worked with a guy who owned a balloon safari company and he then decided to add um, a private detective agency onto his business as a you know completely separate thing but he's already got the capital from what he was doing already to kind of do that and it's the same I think with quite a few clients that they already maybe they're employed and then they're looking to kind of escape that and great business so they've got a bit of money there to kind of invest in it or they've yeah like I say they're kind of trying to test the water with something new. Um, so there does tend to be the kind of the budget available for it. Yeah. All right. So well, you can't go any further if, if, that, if that's the case. But you picked up on two things there. That was a bit of a surprise to me, somebody who's a balloon safari yeah. and wants to have a private detective. Maybe yeah. he just needs to buy a really good drone and then just follow people around. <laughs> yeah. He sold it to Virgin, though, and for a considerable amount. Did said. he really? Did he really? His company. Uh, so I've just put, I've just, that's why I always take notes when I do any one to ones, et cetera, because a bit like Andrew, if I don't take notes in about three minutes, I've forgotten that point and can't come back to it. Um, I've written two things. Uh, somebody that wants to pivot, and through lockdown, there's a number of people mm. that have had businesses but realize that. It's a bit of a dead end and I can't, you know, maybe people in the hospitality business, people are pivoting when it comes to work. That's why we can't get decent waiters and waitresses in, in and maitre d's in restaurants. So there's people that decide to go in a different direction. Probably got money or let's forget the money bit. They want to go in a different direction. They so therefore need your help. And also people have actually sold a business. Uh, people that maybe sold a restaurant or they've sold their uh, assets or whatever. And the good question would be, what are you going to do next? What's, yeah. what's next on the agenda? Mm. And that could be a good question for all of us. You know, what next? That's really interesting. Remember, the questions we ask are always have got the answers. If we think we've got the answers, we obscure the questions. We obscure what's going on. You've never got the answers. It's always a case of asking the question. So people that want to pivot or people have just recently sold a business. Um, and then we've got to explore, not do they need a website? We've got to explain, explore. Um, I mean, let's go back to the guy that wants to, uh, uh, that had the balloon safari, sold it to Virgin. Uh, I would think for a reasonable amount of money. Uh, my first question is, why did he do that at that time? And why a private detective agency? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, I do know. Um, so he sold it because of COVID. Basically, he, he had a year where he was grounded um, and couldn't fly. And so decided and got an offer he couldn't refuse. So decided to sell it. And I think the private detective, I think... Uh, he had used one, um, saw the value in it, and also saw the profit that could be made in it. Um, so that was kind of the reason why he chose that business, really. And is he going to run that himself, or is he going to employ private? Yeah, he um, does a lot himself, but then he will. There are people who specialise in certain things, like data forensics, that he will uh, outsource it to. And then he's also uh, franchised his business. So he sold it to uh, a guy that used his services that he then rec actually recommended me to do the website for. And then I've got more work from him. So he's kind of seen it as a long-term kind of project like that. So he's been, yeah, quite a good, good one to have. 
So that's the case where you've done a particularly good job or you've approached it in a very understanding and sympathetic way and that person's recommended you on. Did they do that? You didn't ask for that. They do that. That could be one of the reasons why we don't think to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with not asking if you've got more than enough business, but that was back to the square one. Um, I suppose photographs for all his private detectives on his website won't be a good thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> he um, actually has illustrations on there for that. that Does he really? Yeah, yeah. Even team. <laughs> I suppose he could do photographs with sort of false moustaches. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen this? Have you seen this man? Uh, let's, let's, Rod, Rod admitted that he, he perhaps doesn't get enough business. Thank you for that, Ollie. Uh, doesn't get enough business. Uh, doesn't ask enough uh, when it comes to funeral plans. Um, can I ask you why is that, Rod? I think it's because of the. <clears throat> there's, I've got a system in place with uh, funerals, uh, but with funeral plans. Um, they seem to take a, I don't know why they take a back seat. They don't take a back seat really, because they are just as important as a, as a funeral. It's almost like when you write a funeral plan, you're writing for a, a funeral for the future, you know? So they shouldn't take a back seat, but because when you're sending off the paperwork, you're utilizing um, a funeral plan company and they act like the, they're like the bank. So, the uh, money goes in trust with a funeral plan company. You never put the money with a funeral uh, director because the funeral director is a business and a business can go out of business as easy as it comes in. So obviously you have to protect your client as well as protecting yourself. And so consequently, it almost leaves my hand. I mean, there's one here just on my desk now ready to go off. And there's the paperwork going off, um, you know, with the check and everything like that. And it's, it's almost like, that's the final thing for me to do, but it shouldn't be. And I, 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 you know, obviously this morning I'm realizing that I really should be. And I'm thinking I'm going to go back to all of my funeral plans that I've ever written and put them on a bloody spreadsheet because I'm useless at that, aren't I? Um, and um, keep in touch with them because uh, there may be lots and lots of low hanging fruit there. And I see a lot of them on the market on a Wednesday. And of course, they come and talk to me. And of course, the first thing I say to them is, well, it's great having you in my sales team. <laughs> well, the point is, many, many, many people find it, I would think, very difficult to talk about their own mortality, their own death. They don't, you know, I think most people think it's just not going to happen just yet. And, uh, and yet yeah, I've just had a friend of mine uh, die uh, at his first treatment of, of uh, chemo. He was talking to me about three days earlier, saying he was very positive and he was sounded very upbeat, not depressed at all. Thought he maybe if he gets three or four more years, great. He didn't survive the first shot of chemo, which of course is quite, can be quite lethal and have the system. So uh, he wouldn't have thought that. There's, there's some shocks about. But so do you find it most, you see that, Anybody here find it difficult talking about their own demise, or the, yeah, or not ready yet? You know, I'm not even thinking I'm, I'm ready yet. So that can be the difficulty. Uh, uh, but I think it's only a question of opening up the conversation. So the point is that Rod has got clients that have decided that they need to have a funeral plan, and some of them will do it on an instalment basis, and some of them will pay for it up front because they've got their money. Why is it they do that, Rod? What is it they get from it? What is What satisfaction do they get about spending money they're not even going to enjoy? Well, the, the reason they do it, I mean, in the main, is they get to a point and they realise that they're not going to live forever. I mean, the lady I went to see yesterday, believe it or not, because I didn't realise it was bank holiday, did I? Because, you know, stupid me. Every day is the same, isn't it, Amory? Um and um, so she was 77. She's got two children. One's blind. Um, and the other, the, the daughter's got uh, children, things like this. So she didn't want to burden them with the responsibility of having to organise her funeral. And so I've now got strict instructions where she wants to be buried. She's a, uh, <coughs> an Orthodox, Orthodox Catholic type person. So she needs to be buried, not cremated. Um, so there's certain things I've got to do now to follow all that through. Um, but 
But mainly the reason for her to do it to, was A, to take away the responsibility from her children, who aren't really children. If she's 77, they can't be children, can they? You know, um, To ensure that the cost of the funeral doesn't go up. So we've set the price. We've now got it set in stone. So she's got two really big problems solved, really. One is she's got me to deal with the whole uh, funeral scenario. I'll already organise it um, and I'll start doing that from today. So, um, you know, even if I wasn't here, someone else could pick the pile up and carry it forward. OK, um, it means that her children only have to get involved with registering the death. They don't have to deal with anything else. The funeral director, whoever it is, if it's not me, it could be someone else could pick it up, no problem at all. Cost isn't going to go up. She's secured the cost. She's secured the, the and dealt with the problem. It's another tick off her list at 77. Um, so she can get on and think about other things. And she hasn't got that as an additional worry to think about. She did mention to me funeral uh, uh, wills and lasting power of attorney. And that's something that I'll refer on to my celebrant who does the wills and lasting power of attorney. So, that's, so that's, that's, uh, and and is raised a good point in the chat to say she, they're buying certainty. I would imagine for a lot of people that weight of worry and concern, knowing that that's put to bed, the final act is put to bed, and mm. and and because also I've picked up from that she's she was thinking about her children and not wishing to burden her children, um, and people that get to a certain age, that's why they. They want to pass down more than they got from their parents in, the, in in terms of protecting their assets or whatever, but also don't want to burden them with the, the challenge of that. And there could be other circumstances. Uh, Nick? Yeah, it just got me thinking, Rob, that you could create such a powerful piece of marketing there. If you could find someone like that client, you could actually do a kind of interview video discussion with them and, and just let her talk about all those fears that she had and and how having a funeral plan will allay all those fears. Could be, I think that could just communicate what you do well. The words not coming from you, but from the class. Um, we've talked about video, haven't we, a few weeks ago? So um, I don't know whether you've ever considered that or thought about that. I would have I thought... I know it's slightly off tangent for today's discussion. But... It's, not, it's not, actually. You've raised a good point there, Nick, because mm. I think the interviewing the person, it's a bit of a private matter, so I don't know whether that would be... As a broker, yeah, the right person, Paul, wouldn't it? I think. Yeah, but also, Nick, you've raised a very good point because he's just told us all the story, and I'm sure these people we're thinking about under those circumstances, he was to tell us three or four more stories. It's those stories that would get me get us thinking about yeah. people we know, or indeed ourselves. Very often, if you want, that's why at a networking meeting, if you talk about a story around the sort of people you'd like to be introduced to, uh, you know, people that are confused, people that are pivoting, et cetera. These people in that meeting will think, hang on, that's me, you know? He's raised a good point. And then tentatively they might approach you for a one-to-one -one or to find out a little bit more, knowing that they're wanting to do it in a safe way to find out about, about, about more themselves. Um, so stories... I know you have stories about your testimonials about why people have used you, um, but developing, you could even develop a brochure, actually, rather than all the facts and figures about funeral plans. These could be a little booklet, which could be a low cost item, you know how to produce those, of different stories as to why people choose funeral plans. What are the fears about you know, the, addressing, you know, all of these things. What are the different circumstances where a funeral plan is really handy? I mean, yeah. there must be lots of people that have got assets that would easily pay or even money in the bank to pay for a funeral. They may, Would they always be, you know, you must have dealt with people that can do that at the block, but they might say, well, I've got money in the bank, let me pay for it now, and I've got rid of that stress. So if you dive down to what the re real reason most people have. So I think stories in a booklet form that, that, that not only could you have on your, uh, on, on, uh, on your, um, your, your stand at uh, the market, but for your funeral, the people that buy a funeral plan, you could actually give them three, send them a confirmation and then three of these booklets to pass on to friends. Good idea. 
I, I was just thinking then of a, a lady not far from you, actually, Paul, and was referred to me by one of your neighbours, actually, Rita Bud, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason she bought a funeral plan was she didn't want to be placed in the same position as she was when her husband died. And she felt very under pressure by the funeral director at that time. And, and it cost her, this is eight years ago, cost her 8,000 or seven or 8,000 pounds. And, um, you know, we did her plan for, I think, three and a half thousand. And she, she reckoned that that was all the pressure at that time. She just said yes to everything. Yes, yes, yes. And then get out of the way, you know. So there's, in, there's, in there's her relaxed there's, environment, she, she could deal with it properly, you know. There's another reason why you would want to arrange your funeral in advance, because at that moment of stress, yeah. you've gone, but somebody else is going to have the pressure to be, you know, from different funeral directors to be having things they don't need. Why would you want to subject your loved ones to that? So, so, but if you can, that, me saying that is like a sales story, but you saying that from somebody else's words is, is far better. Andrew. Yeah, that, that's interesting, actually, because I don't really much about funeral plans at all. And I think I've got certain assumptions about what they are. But even just that story that Rod's told, I don't feel I know much more about funeral plans than I did before I came on this meeting today. You know, and it's actually got me thinking as well, because there's certain things I want in my funeral. And I'm thinking, hmm, would that be the way of locking that in? Because my wife won't remember it, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> You, you've raised another point there, Andrew. Uh, and the, the preface to this booklet, or it could even be a book, Anne-Marie, uh, Life of a Funeral Director, uh, it could be the myths that people have about funerals. It's a bit like F FAQ, but the myths. Blum, blum, blum. And then stories. Or stories and then myths. Ollie. Um, yeah, just... Well, um, it's in there, it reminded me, a few years ago, my father-in-law died, and that all of the, the hassle around and particularly the finance of sorting out um, paying for the funeral, that, uh, that his finances weren't in a good place and ended up that children had to kind of chip in and things like that for it all. And it's just, yeah, it's just on top of all of the other emotions and stresses and things like that to have to worry about that was just horrendous. And I think it's, yeah, if, uh, you know, I wasn't aware about funeral plans until a year or so ago, and I think just people aren't aware of that. Um, then the other thing in, uh, and you're probably aware of this, Rod, in because you're, you're in Wales, I think, are you? Um, in Glastonbury, they have a festival of death and dying, I think, mm. and that would be the ideal yeah, right. kind of place to, you know, go and um, hand something out or, or do a talk, really, at, or something like that to kind of talk to people about... Um, yeah, how you can make that transition much easier and without all of the, the sort of stress and things like that with it all. You just said something there, Ollie, that I, I'd not even thought about. I'm not sure whether Rod has. If you know you've got an eight, and there's a lot of people, I mean, we know that a lot of people in the country and in the US or wherever have only got so much, they've got very little savings and so much in, you know, they can only survive so many months, if that on the liquid assets they've got, even people that are asset rich, they don't have that money in the bank to pay for things. If you've got an aging parent that is in that situation, think of me really, <laughs> well, my healthy kids. Uh, well, if you, on, a, on a serious note, if you've got somebody like that, would it be a useful thing for those kids, to, rather than have to fork out four and a half grand to actually talk to a funeral director about paying the premium for somebody who after, as long as, as I understand it, as long as they survive 12 months, the funeral plan plays out. Would that be, a, it's almost like paying for that in advance. I, I'm not saying that very well, but if you got your head around that, Rod? Yeah, no, that would that would be, a, a, you know, certainly of a benefit to anybody like Ollie that's had to, uh, you know, jump into the breach and chip in, uh, because that's the worst time, isn't it? I mean, the, you want to get these things sorted out beforehand so that you're not under any pressure. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody knows, but the biggest debt on a credit card is a funeral. Really? That's, that, that's awful, you know, to think that all those people that are paying this funeral on a credit card or a debit card, or whatever, it's a credit card, actually, um, just haven't really considered the likelihood of someone dying and not having the money there to pay for it. Now, in a lot of cases, 
if they've got assets or if they've got money in a bank account, because everything gets frozen when someone dies. If they're obviously married, then obviously if it's a joint account, it's not so much of an issue. But if they're a single person and they die, the only bill that the solicitor or the bank can pay is a funeral. Um, and, you know, it, there, there's so many stressful things around this death thing that I think sometimes do, people do look at, look at me on the marketplace and think, what is he doing? Here? You know, because it's they're judging me by their own standards, not realizing I'm there to help, as opposed to, um, you know, I'm not I'm not the uh, grim reaper. <laughs> no, I think that that, that, that session has been useful. Nick, you had a point. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, Rod, I haven't got a clue how much a funeral costs. I know they're not cheap. I don't know whether they cost, and, and I'm sure the price varies. But I mean, I, they're I don't all. One thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. All the prices are on my website. <laughs> Needless to say, um, but yeah, if you said and, and the, what you would in your mind's eye when you think of a funeral, a hearse, the men, the whole thing, everything, no more. And I mean this, no more than three and a half thousand. Unless you want a flash limo and everybody's got a car, what do you want a limo for? Unless Auntie Edna's got a bad leg or something, you know. So three and a half thousand is what I would say. No, any more than that, and it's we're into a massive profit for dignity or the co-op. So that for uh, some people that is a huge amount of money, Rod, isn't it? It's, it is um, a lot of money. Money it's they don't have, money. as you say. Yeah, yeah. It's a hell of a lot of money. I'm, I mean, obviously, you find it's still a lot of money. I mean, we do do the David Bowie. I mean, the David Bowie. I mean, everybody wants David Bowie until they realise that there's no ceremony. We only bring the person into our care, look after them, do the paperwork, get them cremated, and bring the ashes back. But for some people, that's fine. Fifteen hundred quid. Red Mel, you you've had experience in this area in terms of writing copy for funeral plan companies, yeah, etc. That, that's correct. Yeah. You, uh, you know, from what we just discussed, is there anything you, you would want to add to that? I think Rod's, Rod's covered off the main sort of points that, for his, as in all the literature, it's all about, it's about peace of mind for your family and loved ones. And it's about securing the price at today's prices. And that they seem to be the two major selling points. And, and, and like Rod says, these... I, would, I did the writing for dignity, so they were certainly charging, you know, a little, a lot more than what Rod's just quoted. In fact, just just this week, uh, over the weekend, in fact, I've used a there's a company called Let's Talk Aging who who I work with, and they do sort of questionnaires and critiques. So I've critiqued the latest um, fulfillment pack from from Dignity, which is a massively comprehensive piece of print. And it's sent out to people who've, who've actually applied for a, you know, more information about a funeral plan. And there's everything in there. There's, there's a massive brochure. There's a comprehensive application form. There's a questions and answers sheet. And it's a huge piece of print. And so, yeah, and then I think Rod's, Rod's covered it off. So who, who actually underwrites yours, Rod? Um, I, 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 mainly I send them to Safe Hands or Golden Leaves. Yeah. And, and both of those companies have proper trust funds. The difference between the two is one charges 125 quid for their fee, the trust fund fee, and the other one charges 375 pounds. But the difference between the charges is that one guarantees, um, you know, the future growth of the fund, and the other one guarantees it at, at CPI, so mm -hmm. at, at you know rate of inflation. So. I think the other thing that comes out in the fulfilment is what you've covered off. You know, it's not yeah. the money's not sitting with the funeral director, it's sitting in no. a trust fund. So, you know, it can't be touched until, you know, they, they, it's needed. So I need, that's, yeah. that's another very important selling point. So and I the, think. And the other thing, important thing from my point of view is that money's with the funeral plan company, but I've had the experience to draw it down. And so, consequently, no. Why am I using that one as opposed to that one? And um, it's mainly because they react quicker. So mm -hmm. when, a, when someone dies, you want the money straight away. You don't want the money in six months' time. You don't want it in a month's time. You know, it's no good a funeral plan company turning around. We only issue a check every four weeks. Bollocks. 
I'm not being funny. That's not even your money, pal. Get yeah. it bloody here now. You know, so when I give you a, a piece of paper to say someone died and I give you an invoice, pay it. You're only the trustee of that money. Yeah. You know? and, and, and I think the other thing is you've got to pay all the other fees that have got to be paid in advance by you otherwise. Yeah. Before yeah. You're in that. Um, but I, I think that what I've picked up from that is definitely a, a, a different type of brochure by all means, including some of the points Mel's made, you know, about where the money is, et cetera. But I think that is detail, you know, which people can find out on a website. You really want them to be able to pick up the phone and talk to you. Yeah. Uh, and so to be able to give them stories, I think that would be a really magical way. Mm. Be magical. Right. I'm going to go around now and um, uh, just see what we've picked up from this session. Uh, and because we started uh, the session saying that there's a lot of people, 70 to 80 percent of people would give you introductions to new business or people you want to talk to, whether that is a referred client, uh, an introduction to somebody who can use your services, or maybe even a referral partner, a marketing partner. Uh, but only 15 percent of us ask. Uh, have we picked, you know, what have we picked up from today's session about? opportunities to ask and how we ask. So if I can go around, uh, Andy. Um, the using stories that other people have given us in examples in one-to-ones are a brilliant thing really to, you know, you, you're you not trying to create an environment for somebody. You, you're just using the words that somebody else has already used, you know, as an example. And it, it just makes it a lot easier for us because you put it out there, you don't necessarily get a direct, you know, response for the people, but it's plant seeds, doesn't it? And then they go a bit nearer the time, or oh, that is relevant to me in passing it to other people or equally, you know, getting back in touch. I think you've hit the nail on the head, head there, Andy. Uh, it's easier to ask for somebody for an introduction. And by yeah. saying, you know, when, uh, you know, people are... Uh, I, I just think about this. I'm thinking on the spot. Um, I've just had an interesting conversation with a guy, and I must admit, I've never even thought about funeral plans myself. Uh, you, you've got into that situation where somebody's died or whatever. And I think uh, I heard a story the other day from a very good friend of mine that was telling me that it was this couple were faced with this situation. Um, uh, the, the family had to actually chip in uh, to pay for a funeral. The stress of the, losing that loved one uh, at that time meant they were very vulnerable to being sold, all sorts of things, uh, uh, for a funeral they didn't need. And, uh, and then blah, blah, blah. Um, so telling it in the form of a story, people remember stories. So you just said they might not result in anything then but you're more likely to remember a story than you are remember facts and figures yeah. and statutory stuff. Um, and it's an easier way to uh, ask, you know, it's an easy way to inform. Uh, Andrew. I just cannot get out of my head the vision of a private detective following me down the road in a hot air balloon hanging out his basket with a, with a, a, a telescope. Far easy with the drone. <laughs> what have you done, Andrew? <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> far, e far easier with a, hell hellfire, a drone with a Hellfire missile on the end. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're more anti tank as well, aren't they, rather than personnel. But anyway, um, the other series, though, um, I, it's just been very interesting, I think, because of different ways we can ask. Um, our sort of you know, and, and how we keep in touch with people as well. And I do think one of the things, so one thing I will pick up on is this whole thing about um, myth busting, like my, you know, what I'll say about funeral plans, for example. Chance to Chris Briggs recently, I said to him, why don't you put on, obviously you're building his website, and so why don't you put, you know, clothes on? And he said, oh, you don't need to put that because we've been, we've, we've, we've done that for years, you know, you, we didn't work like that, you do a massage. But I didn't know that. 
you know, my assumptions are, in, are, are wrong from that. And again, it's assumed knowledge. It's like Chris knows that because he's been doing it. Whereas the lay person might not, might feel uncomfortable of booking Chris, for example, because you might think, oh, I need to get my kit off or whatever. It was actually done. Yeah, so yeah. again, it's that sort of thing of assumed knowledge. We need to put it out there so that people understand actually what's involved. And I think that's really yeah. come through as well on this, on this call. Good point that people, things we take for granted, other people will not necessarily take for granted. Rebecca. Yeah, really interesting. I think um, just thinking about clarity and coherence um, when talking to clients and potential clients, that's sort of what's come across. So if you can clearly and coherently tell those stories that, will explain and reflect what you do you're more likely to attract the right people so yeah definitely something i need to work on as well i think when you if those of you are going to other networking meetings this week mm. it'd be interesting uh, to maybe plan out four network presentations uh based around stories of people you want to work with and have worked with etc uh, explain that and say I'd like love to work with people you know that are like that I'd love to work with them I'd love an introduction to them because you've given them a reason why they benefited what how you got them why how they benefited um, Martin thank you Rebecca all right I just found meeting um, yeah uh, I really enjoy the stat of 80 percent of people are willing to refer you and that, um, like Ollie said, you kind of need to take that, get rid of your reticence and your whatever shyness or Britishness or whatever, and just um, bring a coherent message exactly <clears throat> what you do and what you want to get. This is who I enjoy working with. You know, the, um, it's just a clearer understanding and it's also good to know everybody's kind of in the same boat and um i also enjoyed learning more about what rod rod does um that was really interesting it's been particularly yeah. valuable about learning about yourself and it's not just about what you do i mean keep you yeah. can mention that again it's um you can explain that and you can say this is why this is why my clients have enjoyed working with me and that's a bit more difficult to say because it's a bit of self-appreciation but mm -hmm. you know other people have said the reason why they like working with me is because i'm prepared to listen i've got that level of experience that younger people don't have or you know people that are straight out of art college they've got that enthusiasm i've got that and the experience and uh especially working with this type of client and uh Again, that plants that firmly in people's minds. Ollie. Sorry, can I just make a note? Um, uh, one of the things that stuck with me actually was, was mega that stat that Rod gave just about the biggest debt on credit cards is funerals and just kind of blew my mind a bit that. Um, but in terms of um, well, um, from this, I think pretty much what Andrew said at the start, just about just trying to make sure I keep in touch with previous clients and continue that because they are you know like we've all said all along the best kind of source of revenue and the most likely to refer us so I think just spending more time just keeping in contact with them checking in making sure they're all right um anything they need you know if there's anything new which I've learned that maybe I can offer them you know upgrades that kind of stuff so yeah I think that's been pretty good and then yeah just um being a bit more um uh, confident to ask for referrals with people that I built up that relationship with. Yeah. Even if you, it, you know, it, you don't have to put any pressure on yourself either because contacting existing clients or people that you've lost a little bit of touch with, that just wanted to reach out and just check out how things are and um, how are things with you? You know, COVID's a great excuse, pandemic, et cetera. Um, how do you see the next month, you know, six months? How do you see the rest of the year panning out? They're great questions, great questions. And, and then just be prepared to listen and see what transpires. Sometimes it's nothing, doesn't matter that you've asked. Uh, but sometimes it's, if you're listening, um, you can pick up on what's said between what's not said or a facial expression. Just, just dive in. As I've done, be prepared to 
dive into those questions a bit more. Nick. Yeah, good session, Paul, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation that you had with Martin. I thought it was, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think Martin, when you when you were talking, you, you talked about some of the kind of smaller projects you do, some of the, the smaller graphic design projects, like a brochure, but then you talked about this bigger project, this overarching project where you got to really um, do the whole the whole work for the clients and build the brand. And I think you enjoyed that more. You probably made a lot more money from it. And that, that kind of really opens opened my mind to, you know, really thinking about what is your ideal client and what's your ideal project and actually then targeting your marketing and your activities towards that. So I thought that was really, and the way you teased that out, Paul, was brilliant um, with Martin, I think. It came to life really well. Well, I think Martin uh, Martin sort of sat up a bit more and he started to express it. Did anybody else notice that? He expressed himself. Yeah, the energy came out. Yeah. And you know what? When you're talking to people, it's easy to be laid back, but actually there's a few physical things you can do that, that bring that expression. You notice my tonality and energy in, in the way I'm speaking now has been deliberately raised because the way we come across with people, people buy confidence. I mean, Andy uh, mentioned it. When people are buying you, they're buying confidence that you know that you're going to lead them to where they want to get to. And sometimes that needs our physicality to change a little bit. And Martin just came alive there. And I know Martin's a little, you know, his nature is a bit more reserved. He's a bit more contemplative. And that is very attractive. You know, he's not going to give you an off-the-cuff, hypey answer. You can see it's genuine. But sometimes it's just a little bit, you know, laid back. So I'm glad you noticed that, Nick. I, I certainly yep. did. I enjoyed that that interview with uh, with Martin. Marcus. Well, um, what I've taken from today is that, Paul, uh, watching you work the room, to get referral or to pass referrals on does take time, effort, and a, a genuine interest in people. Um, and, you know, and you showed that the way you were talking to everybody. Um, and it just made me think about the way I move, want to move my, forward with my networking in that, I'm, you know, I really think LinkedIn and networking groups have their place, but I'm trying to put in place a, a group, of, a small group of people who I think are trusted uh, networking partners that, who I really feel would look after my back as it were and yeah I think that's sometimes it's good to think small as, a, as opposed to looking at the bigger picture. In actual fact if that's if that's important to you that's what you should be asking for you know I, I want to create I know the power of, of, of working with a group of people I understand I relate to I can get on with uh, we share a similar market so it's easy for me to be able to uh, identify business for those people. And that's the sort of people I'm looking for. Uh, because remember, people on that call will probably know people on your next call, your B&I or your uh, business network. Uh, they may know people that they connect you with. It's about connecting. I mean, I've connected you with Michael, uh, the journalist. Yeah, exactly. And already I can see when you two get talking, uh, you, you bounce off each other. And I can see Michael being a good referral partner, even though he's a journalist, he's not in business like we're in business. But the introductions that he can make as you develop that relationship could be very, very valuable. Yeah, I mean, you know, with LinkedIn, it's all about, you know, getting lots of connections and networking groups, the more the better in some ways. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, yeah, you know, you own, I think really, you, how many people do you need that are going to be on in your side? Half a dozen at the most. Half a dozen. When, when <clears throat> somebody once asked me, and I, I, it wasn't my original answer, somebody else had, had asked it and had picked up on it. This is what's the ideal size for a BNI chapter? I said six. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and it's six close referral partners. Uh, Mel, thank you for that, Marcus. Mel. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... In in sort of my business in recruitment, it's quite it's difficult to get the referrals, especially when from my major client who's a an international marketing agency to actually say, well, you know, let's talk about referrals. But on the basis of that, I don't think it's forgot that Marcus and I are having a a one to one over coffee tomorrow, and we're going to talk about marketing agencies because Marcus is interested in getting into agencies. I've got an awful lot of contacts from my long checkered career around Bristol. So we're going to sit down and we're going to try and formulate a plan of targeting 
marketing agencies for sort of referrals. You just said something there, Mel, uh, that I, I just want to mention. Uh, that's great. And, and I, I knew you were going to meet up. And uh, I think that's it's an obvious one the more we've talked about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but remember with eight, well, I don't need, you don't need to remember. It's just the way it was said that creative and marketing agencies and big companies are made up of individuals. And mm-hmm. especially in the creative industry, uh, I know my son knows people in all sorts of different agencies because these those people creatively move around, and so Absolutely. just constantly exploring. Where's so and so? Have you spoken to so and so? Oh, he's moved. Where has he moved to? But, but oh no, he's thinking of moving or whatever. So I mean, just exploring. You know, it's that line of questions that explore that. Mm. Um, that was the way we always picked up business in in the agencies that you and, you deliver on to a client and they enjoy working with you and you're a safe pair of hands, when they move on, they come back for some more. Yeah. And and if somebody, if you place somebody in a company to follow up with that person to see how they're going on, and they'll have, they'll have other people that they've talked to socially say, I've got a new job and I'm really enjoying it, et cetera. Uh, they'll know people that are probably not satisfied or maybe also want to move. And then mm. you're trying to pick up and get an introduction to that person. So... Thanks for that, Mel. And Rod, we've uh, we've we've let you off the leash today. And uh, uh, how is it for you today? What have you picked it's up? Great. I mean, obviously, from my point of view, I've I've got a lot of things to uh, uh, consider and go at, really. But uh, I think from everybody's point of view, I think um, Mel's right. You know, and uh, Marcus is right that you know you've teased an awful lot of information out of an awful lot of people, and um, I think it's helped us all understand where each uh, person uh, is coming from and, and what they're looking to achieve. Achieve, and um, it's been a very interesting session. I've enjoyed it. Good. I've never got the most out of it. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Well, thanks very much to everybody. I'm going to close the call now. Uh, I hope you have a great week. And what I'll do, uh, what I'd like to do later on today or early tomorrow. No, I'll try and do it today is I want to just send out a questionnaire as to what sort of subjects, because we keep, we cover all these subjects. I don't, I think we can go on covering and covering, but I'd like to see, especially with the next four months in mind, what, what, what could help most of us uh, the best? What, what, what subjects would we really want to delve in uh, and, and do? And I think also Chris is trying to arrange something in the Bristol area. I will come up with uh, a date to also to coincide with that or to to marry it up with that so that those that can can meet there or here or, or whatever and we can have a it wouldn't necessarily be the Tuesday morning it would be a, another time where we can meet both maybe at the end of the day or middle of the day whatever and we can in fact I'll include that on the questionnaire which would be a good time for you to do some networking and then when we do that we invite some other people locally just to meet us and uh, just to explore that is All that right. party at your house you're saying, Paul? Party. The unveiling, of, the unveiling of my photographic portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> your first yeah. exhibition, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 B